Thank you, Paul, for that nice introduction. It's good to meet, I was going to say old friends, but they're not old, not, <laughs> not in my book anyway. Former friends and former students, it's very good to see you. And I'm delighted that we're talking about this important subject of energy. Uh, be, before my retirement some six years ago, I used to tell my students that the most serious problem they're going to face in their lifetime is the supply of energy. And I think that's true, very, very true. Uh, my own outlook on energy is that uh, it is going to get so critical and serious in the future that we're going to need everything we can lay our hands on. And that includes renewables, strict conservation measurements, and of course I would say nuclear power as well. Um, I belong to a nuclear advocacy group called Bene. You see our website at the bottom of this page. Uh, which stands for Better Environment with Nuclear Energy. We've been active for about six years and uh, we're like-minded citizens uh, who believe that this country should at least consider the option in the future. And we still believe that despite Fukushima, as I'll, I'll come on to. Um, there is plenty, plenty more information on that and if by any chance you would like to support us, you can click on the website and say, I'd like to become a supporter. Uh, we, the group has given talks in, in about six locations around the country. Three of us give 20 minute talks and we've uh, gone to six places and are going around a number of other places. And I must say we have received a good reception. The three, there was three 20 minute talks. Now I can't give three 20 minute talks here. My time would not allow that. So what I'm going to do, the first talk uh, that, first 20 minute talk was Professor Ian McCauley, one of our committee members. And he outlined the issues and events that uh, affect people's thinking about the nuclear question. Uh, then there was Dennis Duff, another of our committee members who is a power generation engineer and he uh, talks about the myths involved in nuclear energy, and then myself. So as I say, I've only 45 minutes, so I'll try and, sorry, how do I, oh, here we go. Okay, the first one goes back a long way, uh, wind scale, uh, before a lot of you were born. This was a, a nuclear reactor in what's now called Sellafield, uh, which went on fire, it had a, a graphite moderator in it, and the fallout uh, went largely down over Britain. The wind was from the north east, northwest, sorry. Uh, it went down Britain and into the Benelux countries. Uh, no attributable deaths or injuries from it. Uh, and there was factual report in Irish newspapers, but not a lot of fuss in Ireland. Until uh, 1983, when two lady doctors in Dundalk found uh, a group of uh, down syndrome children and at the end of her paper she they uh, said could it have possibly been due to the wind scale fire because the girls were at two schools in Dundalk at that time now this was jumped upon by the press and taken as gospel truth for years and years and it, it just did not make sense for one thing monitoring then and subsequent measurements, there was no evidence that any fallout came to Ireland in the first place. Uh, no Down syndrome were seen after the Hiroshima and Nagasaki bombs. And where was the outbreak of Down, so syndrome, Down syndrome in Britain, where the fallout did go? I mean, it all just did not make sense. And I think, I hope it's largely debunked now. Okay, the other thing that affects people's thinking, of course, is the Sellafield nuclear reprocessing plant in Cumbria. Now remember, it's not a nuclear reactor, it's a re reprocessing plant. Well, they, they have been discharging into the sea for a lot of years, and you can see it in, in marine produce uh, from the Irish Sea. In fact, Ian McCauley, who gave this section of the lecture, that was his life's work, was monitoring the radiation in our environment. The international dose limit for the members of the public <coughs> is 1,000 microsieverts a year. The average exposure in Ireland from all sources is just under 4,000 microsieverts. When the uh, discharges from Sellafield were at a maximum, 
they produced about 70 micro sieverts uh, to a, an Irish citizen. This has now fallen to less than one micro sievert. So the health effects are often alleged, but uh, are they really true? Well, this will be illustrated in this next slide. I'd like to dwell on this longer than I have time for, but this shows where we in Ireland get our radiation dose from. And you can see that uh, radon is the major one. There's radon, you all know about that, the radioactive gas in our houses, 63%. Uh, one other one I'll just mention in passing is internal, in your side, your, oh gosh, sorry. Yeah, internal, inside your body, we all have radioactive material that's naturally there. And the most, uh, the predominant radioisotope there is potassium-40. By the way, it has a billion year half-life. And uh, we have in our body 8,000 disintegrations a second, mostly of potassium-40. I tell people that you can't see it if you put a Geiger to your body because it emits beta particles which only have a range of about five or six millimeters, so they don't get out of your body. But if you were to extract that from your body and put it in front of a Geiger counter, it would scream about 10 times off scale. People get very concerned if they hear a few clicks on a Geiger round cellophane or something like that. But this little tiny bit, see artificial there. Sorry, I can't get my, there it is, here it is. Uh, I've done it again. Here we go. I have a pointer, yes, I have a pointer, yeah. Okay, and you can see the artificial uh, bit there. That artificial is about 1% of the pie, and that includes the in industrial uses of radioactive materials, the nuclear industry, the Chernobyl accident, and Sellafield, all rolled in together. And so people say that little bit is causing extra cancers on the east coast of Ireland and whatnot, when we're all subject to that pie anyway. Of course, the Chernobyl accident was a major accident and affects people's thinking on the subject. Uh, it occurred in the Ukraine, where there was a, a steam explosion in a plant. Uh, this, this was an unapproved experiment taking place in a badly designed reactor without a containment vessel. And as you know, the uh, significant deposition of the fallout uh, came throughout Europe. And I, in fact, was monitoring it in Galway at the time and uh, measuring animals and vegetables and whatnot. Uh, the total dose to an Irish person from the event is about 100 microsieverts. That is, and we've got a, not an insignificant fallout. Uh, that is about the same as you get from a return transatlantic flight because of the extra cosmic rays you get when you go up in the higher atmosphere. Um, the most authoritative study on the effects of Chernobyl are the, is the UNSCEAR report. That stands for United Nations Scientific Committee on the Effects of Tom Atomic Radiation. And they have had an update in just April this year. A huge number of people were evacuated, 335,000. There was major social and psychological disruption. In fact, I've seen it um, described as uh, what, abysmal, dismal fatalism people suffered from. That's not quite the right word. I can't remember it now. Uh, morbid, morbid fatalism. People felt they were victims, not survivors. So uh, major psychological problems. However, the deaths, 28 deaths among the uh, workers and 19 later, some of which might be related. There were a huge number of extra thyroid cancers in children, about 6,000, of which only 15 have proved fatal. So the total fatalities there is only in the 50s, the low 50s. And there's no evidence of birth defects, which comes as a surprise to people in Ireland. And I quote from their report, you can read it there, apart from this increase, that's the thyroid cancer, there is no evidence of a major public health impact attributable to radiation exposures two decades after the accident. There is no evidence of increase in overall cancer incidence or mortality rates are in rates of non-malignant disorders that could be related to radiation exposure. A lot of the people in the surroundings 
that were evacuated actually would have got very relatively small doses. Uh, okay, and now, of course, the Fukushima has come on us. Uh, briefly, uh, the, the, there are two groups of reactors in the area, Daiichi, uh, six reactors, four, five, and six had been shut down already for, for maintenance and service. They are 1970s reactors, so they're pretty old. Down the coast, only about 11 kilometers away, were, are four other reactors uh, in Dini, I think you pronounce it, and they survived the tsunami. I haven't seen discussion of exactly why they did, but, but, but they did. Uh, they were, of course, 1980s models, a bit more modern. The earthquake, which was 9 or 10 on the Richter scale, uh, arrived. Uh, the reactors were only designed for uh, seven. Uh, the reactors actually survived the earthquake, but um, of course the outside power failed. The reactors shut down automatically, outside power failed, and backup generators were started. But then plus one hour after that, a 14 meter tsunami arrived, and the reactors were designed for only about a 5.7 meter tsunami. So it was swamped, and the generators were, uh, were swamped, and so you got no, uh, no cooling water, and so you had overheating of the cores, uh, hydrogen liberated with the extreme heat, and some hydrogen explosions, which blew the outer containment, not the primary containment, blew, blew the roof off several of them. So we have a situation where there's been meltdown in, I think, two of, partial meltdown in two of the reactors. And of course, the, the release of a lot of radioactivity. It's, it's estimated that the release of radioactivity is about 10% of what was released in Chernobyl. Now, the consequences of <coughs> Fukushima. The deaths from radiation are likely to be very few, if any, because precautions have been taken, like the exclusion zone, monitoring of the environment, monitoring of foodstuffs, and whatnot. And then just bear in mind that the actual deaths from the tsunami itself was tw about 25,000 people dead or missing. So countries obviously should reassess their nuclear programs and see should they learn anything from the accident. Uh, this is what we do, say, following an aeroplane crash. There is an inquiry, and uh, you learn something, you hope, from the inquiry to make flying even safer again. And we don't advocate you stop flying, and we shouldn't advocate we stop using nuclear power. J Japan has 55 nuclear reactors, and it is actually very hard to see what they are going to do in the future if they were trying to get out of nuclear power. For one thing, it's a very crowded country and they won't have room for much wind. And, and I have certain opinions that wind and renew renewables on their own won't solve our problems. Okay, now this is uh, Dennis Duff's part of our lectures where he looks at a number of myths about nuclear power. And now I can't, in my time, answer them all, so I'm just going to answer a few of them. It's not safe. Well, actually, it is the safest way of producing electricity, by far. You wouldn't believe what's the most unsafe one, is hydroelectricity. It's surprising, because dams have broken, and when they have, there's one in, in China, I think, uh, that killed like 10,000 people or something, that, you know. So anyway, it, it is very safe. I, won't, I can't elaborate on them all. No solution for waste, doesn't help emissions, the use of nuclear weapons, risk of terrorism, fuel will run out, they're too big, they're too expensive, uh, why don't we use renewables instead? So these were the questions he was answering. And I'm going to deal with the one that's in yellow there, fuel will run out. Well, uh, nuclear power was in the doldrums for a long time because there was plentiful supply of gas and oil, that was part of the reason. And so there was not much more prospecting done for uranium. And uh, also, there's an, an amazing program called Mega, Mega Tons to Megawatts. This was a program with, between the Russians and the Americans where uh, the Americans would use decommissioned uh, Russian nuclear bombs. 
and it was powering like 20% of American reactors. So there's another reason why there, there wasn't people out prospecting for uranium. But this graph shows uh, the red curve is the number of dollars uh, spent on exploration for uranium, and the blue area shows the, uh, as the reasonably assured resources. So you can see, as more money is spent on it, uh, more and more is found. Also, if we, the, the fuel that comes out of our reactors at the moment, you'll hardly believe this, but only about under 2% of the available energy in the uranium has been used. So you've got to recycle and hold that, because in the future, in breeder reactors, you'll be able to use most of that. So you'll get 60 times more energy out of the same fuel than you have been getting already. And this will push the life of the supplies out into thousands of years. So it is virtually uh, sustainable. OK, doesn't help emissions. There are some people who say, ah, sure, all the concrete you have to use, all the mining you have to do, surely there's vast amounts of carbon dioxide emitted in that process. Well, this is uh, an IAEA uh, graph of the carbon dioxide emissions from different forms of generating electricity. The two bands that you see there are um, the two bands are high and low estimates, and the red is the direct emissions from burning. So you see coal here generates about uh, a kilogram, a thousand grams for every kilowatt of electricity you produce. And they go on down, there's gas, there's hydroelectricity, solar, uh, photovoltaic, that is wind energy, and there's nuclear, low 9 and 21. And that takes account of all the reprocessing, mining, all the uh, different processes involved. So that's a myth, definite myth. No solution for waste. Well, certainly this is a, a, an issue that raises a, a lot of problems. Uh, I personally have not much problem in, uh, I think the science of it has been done in, in that you can uh, sink it into deep repositories. Uh, and I'll just say a few more words about that. Waste remains dangerous for hundreds of thousands of years, fact or fiction. Well, you may have heard of James Lovelock, the very famous environmentalist of Gaia, fame, if you know what that is. And what he says is what is remarkable about nuclear waste is that it fades away compared to, say, heavy metals in the environment. Uh, in 600 years, the high-level waste from a nuclear power station is no more radioactive or dangerous than the uranium ore from which it originated. So I, ha I have tried to confirm this statement by him. I haven't been able to, I must say. But uh, it, it sounds not unreasonable to me. Okay, this is a thing unknown to a lot of people, that there were naturally occurring radio, uh, nuclear reactors. Uh, ran in the Gabon in Africa. 17 of them have been found. This was uh, about 2 billion years ago, when you had much more of the uranium-235 present, so more amenable to having a nuclear reactor. And these operated for between 100,000 and 500,000 years. And they have studied those now, and most, most of the waste has not moved at all. So it's a good uh, place to study the movement of radioactive waste uh, for uh, research into uh, deep repositories. OK, now to my own part of the three lectures. Uh, Ireland's energy need. Well, we need sustainable, low carbon, secure, balanced energy mix. We're currently, and this is frightening, 89% dependent on imported fossil fuels. In fact, I often show a slide of the world's use of fossil fuels, and it's a most alarming slide. It shows over the centuries man's use of fossil fuels. And the graph comes along, and a, there's a blip up and a blip down, and down. Just as quick, over a period of about 400 years, 
man will have found and used up all fossil fuels that took millions of years to form. This is most alarming. Uh, we get our oil largely from the Middle East. That's not terribly stable. We get a lot of our gas from Russia by a, a gas line. Is that stable? They, they cut off the supply to Ukraine w once, and it comes through Scotland, I think it is, and across to Ireland. Uh, coal is, is more widely distributed, so not such a big problem. We need to reduce our electricity prices. Uh, the Irish Academy Engineering of Engineering, in a report earlier this year, I'll just read out their statement, Irish energy prices, particularly electricity prices, are among the highest in Europe, indeed among the highest in the world. What constraints do we have, not only in Ireland but worldwide? Well, you've all heard of global warming. So we must re uh, reduce the use of fossil fuels as they produce greenhouse gas emissions. We must face into the future for the decline of fossil fuels. We've, we've already reached peak oil. This is an alarming fact that world production has peaked now and is going to start going down. And this is at a time when China and India are demanding and hoping to get more and more. So that's going, the prices will just go up and up, skyrocket. Peak gas may be 2025, thereabouts. Although, you see, I've written plus shale gas. A lot of talk recently about major fines of gas and oil bound up in, in shale. It is controversial in the means they have to extract it. But I hope that it will give us leeway, uh, more time to come up with alternatives. And that includes renewables and includes even better nuclear power. It's hard to find much data about peak coal. I certainly used to think, oh, there's plenty for hundreds of years, so we needn't worry too much. Uh, but there's an energy watch group in Germany who advises the German uh, government, and they say it could occur as early as 2030. So we have a difficult situation ahead. But in particular, in Ireland, in 1999, there was the Electricity Generation Act and Trevor Sargent of the Green Party put in an amendment which said Ireland should not, cannot have nuclear power. So it's actually against the law in Ireland. The advantages of nuclear power for Ireland. As I've said already, virtually sustainable, out to thousands of years. Uh, by the way, there's also, as well as using, to, to burn up the um, uranium-238, you need what's called fast reactors. But there's a lot of work going on, especially in India, uh, for thorium, thorium reactors. Now, this has a lot of benefits. I'm not an expert on thorium at all, but thorium is about four times more prevalent on the Earth. They, India have a lot of it. You don't need to enrich it. When you mine it out of the ground, it's, it's ready. It's not uh, fissionable itself. It's what's called fertile. It, it needs to be uh, used in a reactor uh, using uranium first to get it going, and then it goes itself. So you're, you're, you're breeding more fissionable material. Um, and a beauty of it, too, far less waste, and the waste is very much shorter lived, like a few hundred years. So this is maybe a way of the future. Stable fuel supplies, uh, Canada and Australia are two of the main suppliers of uranium. It's a proven mature technology, uh, 13,000 uh, reactor years of experience. And by the way, America is the country with the most reactors at the moment. It is 104, and there has not been a single death associated with, with the nuclear power. Ditto in Britain. There hasn't been a, a, a fatality. It's economic, and I'll come on to that in the next slide. Uh, it has an, about a 90% load factor. That means it's up and operating 90% of the time. Whereas wind energy, the advocates in Ireland say with great wind, and it's uh, load factor 30%. But last year was a particularly bad year for wind, 
only 21.5% of the, of the rated output you get from wind. And I'm told, and I haven't looked up these figures myself, the first six months of this year it was 16%. And so what do you do? You've got to have backup when the wind doesn't blow, and that makes it expensive. So the um, nuclear power is the only source of energy that ticks the boxes that I, I put up a minute ago. Oh, it's the only source of low carbon, safe, sustainable, and reliable baseload electricity. It's there on reliable. It's reliable. The relative cost of power generation from the different sources and this was in the Irish Academy of Engineering report, uh, 2009. And you see, this is the cost up, up the, the axis on the left is the pence. This was, they, they were reporting on a British study, uh, pence per kilowatt hour. Offshore wind, the most expensive. Then biomass, I won't detail them all. Then this is uh, coal. And by the way, they're talking about uh, capturing, carbon ca capture and storage from coal, but it's likely if that ever comes about, it's very difficult, it might even double the cost of, of coal generation. Uh, wind onshore, a good deal cheaper than offshore, uh, about two-thirds of it. Coal, this is combined cycle gas and nuclear. Uh, so the one interesting thing while we have it there is you see in the nuclear bit there, you see, um, you see the blue section there. The blue section is the fuel, the cost of fuel. And you compare that with uh, uh, wait now, gas, yes. You see gas here, has the, the, the yellow section is the capital cost. So nuclear has a high capital cost, but a very low fuel cost. I mean, when you think a, a modern big nuclear reactor only needs 20 tons of uranium a year, enriched uranium. Whereas our coal plant at Money Point of the same size uses 2 million tons of coal a year. So anyway, gas, uh, uh, very relatively cheap to build, but look at the cost of the fuel. And that's volatile and likely to go up. Whereas if the uranium cost goes up, it has relatively little effect on the cost of nuclear power. Okay, what's happening around the world in the nuclear scene? Well, this is very recent. You can see, I've just looked it up in the last few days, the latest statistics on the number of nuclear reactors around the world. And there are 440 operating nuclear power plants, generating 15% of the world electricity. 62 under construction and 496 planned or proposed. 29 countries have and uh, 17 are now proposing to join the nuclear club. Uh, interestingly, I went back to the figures pre-Fukushima because some people say, oh, there's going to be a major retrenchment now in people's attitude. Well, the actual number of proposed nuclear plants was, I think, like 465 or 75, maybe. So the actual number of proposed has gone up, not down, uh, since Fukushima. Okay, nuclear power in some European countries. France is the shining example. Uh, get more than 75% of their electricity from 58 operating nuclear power supplies one more under construction, one planned, and a further proposed. And interesting enough, the remaining 20, 25% of their electricity is almost all generated by hydroelectricity. So they're not dependent on fossil fuels for their electricity. And one, one of their biggest export businesses, too, is exporting electric power. Sweden. Sweden has had their doubts uh, but uh, after much debate have, are much in favour of keeping their nuclear power. They have 10 nuclear power plants generating 35% of their electricity. Uh, and they're hoping to be oil free by 2035 or something like that and there's no way they could do it without uh, having nuclear power. 
Finland, it's often said Ireland's too small a country to have nuclear power. Well, look at Finland, about the same population as ourselves, very environmentally conscious country, as is Sweden. And they have four reactors, building one, proposing further two, generating a third of their electricity. Interestingly, they are also building a repository uh, beside this latest nuclear plant for, for the waste. Italy now have had an interesting uh, situation. They started building one reactor. They're proposing, we're proposing 10. They started building one and then Chernobyl arrived and they stopped. Then they waited a few years and they said, oh no, now we'll start again. And Fukushima arrived. So they've stopped again. It's one of the few countries that has, in, in my uh, searches, been affected by the Fukushima. Uh, Ukraine, where the Chernobyl accident happened, have 15 operating reactors generating nearly 50% of their electricity, planning to and proposing a further 20. And Belarus next door, uh, which hasn't had nuclear power, and they were badly affected by uh, Chernobyl, uh, planning to and proposing a further two. Uh, Germany, which is uh, on the news in this regard, of course, recently, have 17 and had generated 26% of their nuclear power, of their electricity, sorry. Uh, no plans for the future. Well, as you've heard in the news, uh, Angela Merkel, probably for political reasons, uh, they have phased, they plan to phase out their nuclear program by 2022. Now, it, it, it is, they're, they're already going down the renewables route. I think they're getting 17% at the moment and they hope to get much more than that. Uh, I would not be surprised if this decision is reversed yet again. Uh, Incidentally, what are they going to do? Well, they're planning to, to build more coal plants. They're planning to import French nuclear electricity and whatnot. And I read somewhere that because of their withdrawal from their <coughs> nuclear program, there will be an increase of 40 million tons of CO2 they, they give out every year. So it's not all plain sailing by any means. Uh, some other countries, non-European countries, and what's their program? Uh, USA, as I've said already, uh, 104, uh, planning nine, proposing 22. China and India now have major nuclear programs. And you see they have very little at present, only generating a few percent of their electricity. But you see the numbers proposed or planned China, Plan 39, proposing 120 nuclear reactors. <coughs> India, 20 and 40. And Russia, also a lot more. You can read them there yourself. Uh, an interesting country. Of the 17 countries that are, are, are going to enter the club, one is United Arab Emirates. You would have thought they have plenty of oil, no problem. But they see the writing on the wall and are planning 10, plan, planning for and proposing 10 nuclear reactors. Ireland's targets for electricity production. Uh, the government target is that we should generate 40% of our electricity from renewables by 2020. And this has to be primarily wind because other renewables are less well developed. Problem, as I mentioned already with wind, is the variability. We have limited hydroelectricity. Tidal power is also limited. There's a little bit up at the Strangford Lock, at the mouth of the Strangford Lock. Wave power, very unproven, uh, and uh, is also very variable. Talking about being variable for wind and tidal, the actual energy you get from your turbine goes as the cube of the velocity of the water of the wind or the wind. So if you have a certain generation of wind and the wind drops by a factor of two, the output from your generator goes down by a factor of eight. And ditto with water. Wind needs backup, as I've said. This is uncharted territory. There's no one else in the world uh, 
has achieved anything like this. And you've still got to ask yourself, where is the 60% going to come from? Wind energy elsewhere. Denmark is a good country to look at. They're world leaders in wind energy. They have a huge export business in turbines. And they are readily backed up by supplies from Norwegian hydroelectricity when the wind doesn't blow. And Sweden and Germany, they're also linked to. And it only achieves, after 30 years' efforts, 9.7% of the electricity from wind. And we're hoping to get 40%. I think it, it really is uh, very uh, fanciful, I think. Uh, interesting, if I read a report in the paper about Spain, and it was, I think, in, uh, I can't remember the paper, an Irish examiner, maybe. And it said, Spain got 50% of its electricity from wind in October. I said, great, and you, and you look it up the facts. This was on one Sunday morning when the demand was low and the wind was favorable. And the actual average in Spain is 11%. By the way, our, we get 12% at the moment from wind. A Spirit of Ireland initiative, I don't know whether you remember this, uh, this was in all the newspapers, a full page ad a few years ago, 2009, where this group proposed uh, having uh, a lot of what they call a natural energy power station on the west of Ireland, where they would put up a huge number of turbines and they would create a new artificial lake where they'd pump, where the wind blew well, they'd pump water up to the lake and when the wind dropped, they'd, they'd generate electricity. A lot of, a lot of uh, recommendation to it. Their quoted specification, it would be 700 milliwatts, but to get that, you'd have to install about three times that of wind generators because of the load factor. Their lifetime is only about 25 years, and it gives the storage energy and the cost, and the cost of electricity. Oh, that comes up on a, on a next slide. What would this entail? Approximately 600 turbines, the height of the spire in Dublin. They're massive machines, 600 of them. It would, I've calculated uh, that if you had a new lake, 120 meters elevation and a 20 meter deep, deep lake, it's easy to calculate that you'd need 18 square kilometers of reservoir. And they say they'd need 300 uh, million for wiring. If you compare, this is, this is like a school exam, compare and contrast the Spirit of Ireland station to a nuclear power station. So both of them the same power. The footprint, the nuclear power plant would occupy about a football pitch. Spirit of Ireland, this 18 square kilometer lake and 600 turbines located around it, lifetime. Modern nuclear power plants can even be longer than this, 60 years, 25 years. Capital costs, a bit hard to say on the newer nuclear power plants, the smaller ones that would be suitable for Ireland, uh, about a, bi a billion. And at their own admission, 3.45 billion. Electricity cost, nuclear likely to be about 4 cents per unit, 7.5 cents. Grid requirements. For nuclear, very little change because we've been used to centralized big plants, whereas very extensive change necessary for wind generation. Now, uh, my, how am I doing for time? Five? Five. Okay. Uh, suitable nuclear reactors. It's often said that the current nuclear reactors are too big for Ireland. And there's some truth in that because the, the move, there has been a move towards bigger and bigger ones. And you couldn't accommodate, you, you shouldn't have more than about 10% of your generation in any one plant because of when it goes down. And that would, need, that would mean you'd only want one about four or 500 megawatts, whereas a lot of the newer ones are 1,000 megawatts or more. But there are newer ones coming on the market. There are some out there already, but newer ones coming on the market. And this particular one is called the IRIS, uh, International Reactor Innovative and Secure. And this is a cooperative effort between 21 organizations and countries spearheaded by Westinghouse. This is an advanced passive design. That means that if all power fails like it did in Fukushima, 
there would be, I think, about three days of natural gravity feed from, from water supplies, during which time things could be rectified, and so it, it's, it's a lot safer. Modular design and small, you'd need two of those for my uh, uh, power station of 700 megawatts. A modular design, this means that the reactors are relatively small and a lot of the components can be made back in the factory. Uh, this, this will reduce price uh, and uh, have better quality control. Uh, this is uh, suitable for small countries. It's very hard to know when it's going to be available, but it's, it would take so long in Ireland to get it planned, etc., etc. It would be out by the time we got round to it. Uh, at the moment, 3.5 year refueling, and apparently they've extended that out maybe to six or seven or even eight years. It's amazing, isn't it amazing? A nuclear power reactor generates power and you only need to refuel it every three and a half years. I won't go into this other pebble bed reactor. Uh, this, uh, well I said briefly, this was uh, developed in Germany initially. Uh, they got out of it and it was taken on by South Africa and they were having financial problems and it's now being developed in the USA and China. This, uh, the fuel uh, elements and the moderator are together in, in uh, pebbles about the size of uh, a tennis ball. And you put thousands and thousands of these in the canister. And, hot, uh, and gas goes through them to cool them and extract the heat. But they are inherently safe. Apparently, if e everything fails, the natural convection of the gas through the core will not let it get too hot. And you can start up again when, when, when the emergency has passed. A Westinghouse has also announced very recently a 200 megawatt small modular reactor announced in February this year. Also, there's, uh, and I forgot to change the name of it, at the bottom there, there's an organization called the Global Nuclear Energy Partnership. People say, oh, what are we going to do about waste in Ireland? You know, we don't have a repository or what? Well, the Global Nuclear Energy Partnership, and as I say it has a new name now, is a coming together of the nuclear energy countries to help the smaller countries. And they would supply you with your fuel and take back the spent fuel. So we wouldn't have any problems with a waste repository in Ireland. A number of official bodies have been urging over the last five or six years the government to consider the option. Airgrid, Engineers Ireland, ESB Strategy, ESRI Working Paper, Forfus, Irish Academy of Engineers, Irish Congress of Trade Unions, urging the government to consider it. But there's not a politician yet is prepared to put their head above the parapet. So, whether nuclear power for Ireland, what should we do? Well, uh, obviously we need to rescind the amendment to the Electricity Regulation Act. We suggest that an expert group be formed to advise the government on nuclear power. Is it suitable for Ireland? Uh, it's a complex question when you have high wind generation. People, some people say they're bad bedfellows because a lot of reactors were not very uh, easily ramped up and down. And you have to ramp up and down quickly because wind can go up and down awfully quickly. But the newer reactors are capable of ramping up and down pretty quickly. And when you think of nuclear submarines, they have to ramp their reactors up and down as they maneuver. And nuclear sh ships, too, have to ramp up and down. So that can be done. Uh, and also to answer, look at the questions of sharing nuclear power with the UK and maybe even France. And funding resources. Interestingly, Britain, when they announced their new build, said that there would be no government money put into nuclear power. And it would have to be private enterprise. And uh, some people say, oh, nuclear, you can't have that. The only way you can have it is, is government funding. But that's not true. And we should maybe approach Arriva in France, who are, I think, half responsible for the cost of the Finnish reactor, which is way over budget. And Endesa in Spain, 
who have uh, conventional plants in, in Ireland maybe would be interested in funding. That's the end. Thank you very much. And don't forget Benny. <laughs> Thank you.